I'm trying to get a right position out, out of those lights, but I don't think I can find one because they're coming from both sides into the middle. Anyway, good morning, everyone. It's lovely to see you on this Mothering Sunday. Um, I wasn't aware until a few years ago, really, that there are two different Mother's Days, a Mothering Sunday and a Mother's Day. Now, the Mothering Sunday is the religious connection, which goes back a long way, many centuries. But really, it came over to Britain from the USA, as a lot of stuff does. Um, a lady called um, Anna Jarvis, she set a day in 1907 to honor her mum, her late mum. And of course, we adopted that some years later. And that is always um, celebrated on the second Sunday in May. So this year, that would be the 12th of May. But Mothering Sunday, which we celebrate, is a day in Lent. Lent starts on Ash Wednesday. And um, Mothering Sunday is the fourth Sunday in Lent, and always three Sundays before Easter Sunday. So maybe some of you have learned something this morning. But anyway, um, I do have some Bible readings, but first I want, you to, I want to tell you a little story, not so much a story, but an account of my mum, my late mum. Um, I am one of eight children. I've got four brothers and I've got three sisters. And believe it or not, in a period of six years and 11 months, my mother gave birth to six of us. There, I've got one older brother, he's child number one, and we've got a youngest sister, she was child number eight, and I was one of those six who were born within six years and 11 months. So you can see the sort of job that she had on her hands, can't you? She was an only child, believe it or not. <laughs> she was loved by her mum and dad very much, especially her dad, he absolutely doted on her. And um, I think she probably felt a little bit isolated, maybe a little bit lonely being on her own and probably thought when I get married, I'm not gonna have my child, I'm not gonna have one child, I'm gonna have lots of children. Perhaps that was the way she thought about it. But anyway, she ended up having eight, eight of us. And we love each other very much. Believe it or not, we never argue. We, they, we're all over the country, but we see each other regularly to keep in touch since mum and dad has passed. Mum looked after us all very well. She took us to school. She took us to the doctors. She took us to our friend's house to have time with our friends. She cared for us when we were sick. And in a house with eight children, you can imagine, when one of us had measles, we all had measles. When one of us had chicken pox, we all had chicken pox. So we, she had to, eight of us to look after at one time. Um, she bought the groceries, she made our dresses, she knitted our cardigans and our sweaters. She baked cakes and pies on a weekend. That was a, a special occasion. She washed, mended, and ironed all our clothes. You can imagine how many there were with eight of us. She put us to bed every night with a hug and a kiss. She got up early and she went to bed late, as you can imagine. My mum demonstrated a life of sacrificial love and giving, putting our needs before her own day after day. This kind of love is one of life's rare gifts. Don't you agree? Yeah. Um, most women have a mother's heart, I believe. I believe most women do. We hear some not very nice stories, some ugly stories of women. Uh, and I, I don't want to say any more about that today, really. But we have birth mothers. We have adoptive mothers. We have stepmothers. We have teachers and nurses with a mother's heart. The list can go on and on, can't it? It's all about the heart, isn't it? It's all about the mother's heart. And that's what I want to talk about today. Because we all have the same tendencies as women. Because of that natural God-given hormonal response that he's given us to children in our care, whoever they may be. 
So I said I've got some scriptures. First of all, I want to ask you, while I'm looking for this verse, I want to ask you a question. I'm sure somebody will give me the right answer. If I said, who, if I said the name Jochebed or Joshabed, however you want to pronounce it, who would you say was one of her children? Anybody? No looking it up. J-O-C-H-E-B-E-D, Jochebed. Otherwise, I'm going to read this verse and I'll give you the answer. In Numbers 26 and verse 59, who said that? No. Oh, that's not the answer. No, Alan, what is the answer? Moses, yeah, you're right. You're right. It's Moses. Well done, Alan. So in Numbers 26 and verse 59, this is what it tells us. It's um, in Numbers, this is the second census that Moses had to do. God told him to do some census. The first one was to... Um, count the number of men within the Israelites between certain ages, 20 or 25, I think, to 50, something like that. And then he said, um, Levi, the tribe of Levi wasn't included in that census because he set apart the tribe of Levi to become priests for him, dedicated to him and his service. So the second census was this census, and it tells us in verse 59, um, or I go... No, 59. The name of Amran's wife, Amran, was Jochebed, a descendant of Levi. Here we are. So they're the priestly, priestly ancestry, who was born to the Levites in Egypt. To Amran, she bore Aaron, Moses, and their son Miriam. So yes, Jochebed was Moses' mother. Um, so I'm going to now read, I'm going to go to Exodus now and read about the birth of Moses. And it's Exodus 2 and the first 10 verses. And I'll read them. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. We just, we just read that. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she couldn't hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood, his sister Miriam, stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. So the background, let me give you a bit of a background to this story. Joseph, do you remember Joseph who was taken captive into Egypt? and his brothers, the famine, you know, that's one of the, um, you know, Sunday school stories that I, I know, I remember. Joseph and his brothers had died. They'd all died, and the Pharaoh had died as well, the one who he was second into command to. And in Egypt, a new king, a new Pharaoh came onto the throne. And he didn't know Joseph. He didn't have that connection with Joseph. He didn't have a relationship with any of his family. And he could see that in Egypt, the Israelites were becoming very numerous in number. You could see they were becoming a very powerful people. And what he decided to do, because I, I guess he feared that they were going to overtake them and take over the land. 
And what he told the midwives to do was any child that was born to kill them. Well, the midnights didn't, didn't listen to him. Um, and so they start, the, the baby boys were born. And so he, he sort of took them to task and he said, you know, right, okay, I want the baby boys, any baby boy that is born, I want them thrown into the river and killed. And this was a scenario in which Moses was born into. And so his mother uh, notes the words in that verse. It says, she made a basket. She covered it in tar. Um, I was wondering, where, where was Amran? Where was the father? You know, surely... <laughs> These, these days, you get, you know, the men are more likely to build, I would say, to build um, a basket and to tar it. But I think I'm, I'm a little bit of our older generation where women did one thing and men did another. And it's a lot different today, isn't it? Well, anyway, she wanted to protect her son. He was born. She didn't want him being thrown into the river. So she decided, he got to a certain age, it said he was three months, and he got to a certain age where she couldn't hide him anymore. So I guess he was becoming a bit more voice, boisterous, a bit more vocal. And, and so she decided the best way to, to save his life, to, to you know, preserve his life, was to put him in a basket and to hide him. I don't know what she thought, what was gonna happen, but anyway, she, she put him in the basket to hide him, um, to protect him. And as we read in the story, um, Miriam, the daughter, uh, stood a little bit afar off, I think just looking to see what was happening, to see if he was safe. And she saw the Pharaoh's daughter coming down to the river to bathe with her, with her servants. Now I'm sure Pharaoh's daughter knew of her father's decree, knew that he had told his people that whoever it was, to throw the baby boys into the river. And yet here she was. Uh, you know, we see here, I've, I've called this, this message uh, a mother's heart. And a mother's heart doesn't, as I said, it's not, doesn't have to be a birth mother. A mother's heart, we see the birth mother, Jochebed, with a mother's heart, you know, wanting to protect her son, wanting to preserve his life. She didn't want to see him killed, thrown into the river. I see Miriam, a, a daughter, a, a sister, with this mother's heart that is starting to grow within her. You know, even though she's young, she's got this mother's heart. She's protecting her brother. We see Pharaoh's daughter coming down to the river with a mother's heart. She hears the baby cry. What woman, when a baby is in distress, do you not want to pick them up and hold them and hug them and cuddle them and make them feel safe? And so Pharaoh's daughter came and she, she wanted to take this child and protect him. And, and so Miriam, in her wisdom, she said, but shall I get a Hebrew woman to look after him? Now, my thought is I'm going a little bit away here I wonder whether there were women there who's had their baby boys taken from them and thrown into the river and still had that milk. And so Miriam was saying, can I go and get a Hebrew woman you know, to look after him? Somebody that's going to be able to feed him, you know? They didn't have whatever the brand names of the milk, the powdered milk these days. They fed them themselves. And so she said, yes, go and get this. So what did Miriam do? She went and she got her mum to come. And the, and the Pharaoh's um, daughter said, take care of him and I will pay you. First instance of child benefit, don't you think? <laughs> I think. And um, so Jochebed takes Moses and I'm guessing that she's taken him now and she's going to keep him until she can wean him, yeah? Until he can eat more solid food. And this day comes, and she keeps her word, which must have been really, really distressing for her. She takes him back to the princess, and she takes him then as her son. And it says in the last verse, she calls him Moses, not Jochebed. The Pharaoh's daughter calls him Moses. I drew him from the water. And so here we have a natural birth mother, and here we have an adoptive mother. And in all of this, God is in this story, yeah? Because 
when we read about Moses in the Old Testament, what God did through him is an ama amazing. If he didn't place Moses in that particular place at that particular time, who knows where the Israel people would be, you know? We see that thread all the way through the Old Testament, how he brought the Israel people, the Isra Israelites, all the way through. He kept them out of danger. There was always a remnant. And he raised up Moses to do that, to, to bring them through the desert. First of all, to, to lead them out of captivity, out of Egypt, through the desert for 40 years. I, I'm sure it could have been a lot sooner than 40 years, but they grumbled, didn't they? And they complained. And God said to Moses, take them back in the direction of the Red Sea, he said. I'm not going to put them into the promised land. And in fact, he said, none of those men, he said, over the age of 20, will see the promised land because of their grumbling and their complaining. But Moses had to put up with all that. And God actually called Moses a friend. Moses was able to go into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and speak to God face to face. He was one of those men, those only men who he could speak to face to face. But all this while, God protected Moses in the enemy's home, in the palace. He was there in plain sight. And God took him and nurtured him through the princess and um, did that amazing work with him um, all those years until um, because of a little bit of disobedience, he said, right, Moses, you're not going to go and see the promised land. And he went up to that mountain, didn't he? And he looked over, he could see the promised land, but he didn't actually go into the promised land. He died in Moab when he was 120 years old. And I want to I wanna, um, just bring to you another story. I'm going to look at it in Matthew 2 and 13 to 17. Not many verses, but just to give you a comparison of another story that we all know very well. And um, this is the birth of Jesus. And it says the escape to Egypt. This was going, actually, Mary and Joseph was taking Jesus into, G, into Egypt to escape. And it says, when they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up, he said, take the child and his mother and escape to Egypt. Stay there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to kill him. Here's another one. <laughs> So he got up, took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said through the prophet, out of Egypt I called my son. And when Herod realized that he'd been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem and its vicinity who were two years old and under in accordance with the time he had learned from the Magi. Then what was said through the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. Here we have another occasion of boys, uh, of these murderous men in authority trying, this time it was kill King Herod. He was out to kill him. And he put, a, he put a, an order out to have all the boys, two years old and under, to be killed. And as we read, the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, and he took Mary and the baby Jesus and, and escaped to Egypt. And we know the story, all the wonderful story in the word of God of Jesus, um, the, the savior of the world. So God selected two women to look after two important men in scripture, yeah? to nurture and to care for them as children whose safety was under threat from murderous authorities. Both mothers were loving, faithful, and courageous. And as a result, their sons, one of them led Israel out of slavery in Egypt to the land God had promised them, and the other led his people out of slavery to sin into new life. 
Now, Jochebed, we read here, only had her son for a short period of time, didn't she? I guess two years at the most, I would say. I don't know. Um, and Mary probably didn't have much of a great influence on Jesus, I wouldn't think. There's only a number of times in the Bible, in the New Testament, that we read about an encounter that Mary, the mother, had with her son Jesus. One of them was, remember, when he was 12 and they lost him, and they found him in the temple when he was 12, and he said, did you not know that I was going to be in my father's house? The other one was the marriage in Cana, where she was at the wedding, where, um, you know, that was the other story that we read of between Jesus and his mother. And the third um, one was, I guess, on the one when she was at the cross, when Jesus was crucified. So there wasn't, I wouldn't say she had a m massive influence on his life. I think God the Father had the, the most influence on Jesus' life. But here we have, as we said, two men, two pivotal men in the Bible, two crucial men's lives in the Bible, that if, they had, if their lives had been snuffed out, the whole story of the Bible would be different. But we had two women who nurtured them. Um, when you think about it, yeah, a woman is a child's first home for nine months, yeah? And through the birth, a child emerges from the warmth and security to be nursed with its first source of nourishment and comfort. That's, you know, when a woman gives birth, that's how amazing the miracle of birth is. God formed men and women differently, didn't they? We all know that God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, and he formed Eve, took a rib out of Adam's side, and he took um, Eve and, and made a, um, a, a woman for Adam from his side. I'm going to stick my neck out a little bit here now. As I said, I am a little bit more of a traditional mum, mother, you know. So I'm going to stick my neck out a little bit here and say mothers and fathers are bound to their children in a different way. I know, I know they are more, fathers are more right hand, on right hand, do, looking after their children today. I know that. When I, when I see my father, my father used to play with us and, but not, not like I mentioned what mum used to do for us, all the work, looking after us, feeding us, all the rest of it, clothing us. I think mothers and fathers are bound to their children in a, a, a little bit of a different way. And I know times are changing, I will say that. But you think about it. How many times have you heard people say, oh, I think that dad's a little bit too heavy on him, too, a bit too firm on that child or whatever? And how many times have you heard it say, oh, that mother, she's a little bit too soft on that child. You know, so you've got those two, two things going on there with a man and a, a husband and, and a wife and a mother and a father. And what about a, a dad who wants to see his child get out in the world, be independent, you know? And how many times, you know, you say, oh, my daughter's going to university, you know, she, the mother wants to hold on, she wants that connection forever, she does never want to, want to let go of that child, you know, so you've got those two things going on, you know, you've got that, ooh, I want to keep her, and they no, go on, go on, get out in that world, you know, live. So, and it shouldn't surprise us either that women, after they've had a child, they continue to um, have an inward focus, you know, an inclination to make home, I want to make home, you know, that nest for my children, you know, you know, protect them, nurture them, comfort them, you know, nurturing them. Oh, come and eat, come and have this dinner, love, you know, make this food for you. Come and have a sandwich. Now, don't go out without anything to eat, you know. Have you got a coat on now? It's cold out there. You know, that's a woman. That, that is a natural instinct of a woman, you know, and wanting to give comfort and shelter within four walls. That is a woman's instinct. That's how God made us, guys. That's how God made us. But the children God has given us, and I'm not talking about a birth mother here now, I'm talking about in any sense, in any form in the world, however we have that relationship with children, it could be in a job, it could be whatever, He's given us, um, the, our children, to love and cherish and care for. And that brings out motherhood in our heart. 
It brings out motherhood in our heart. Now, we know that motherhood is hard work. We all know that it's hard work. But we are not perfect. We know that mothers are not perfect. You know, I did have a little look, and I'm not going into that because I haven't got the time today. But you go into the Isaac and Jacob and, and read about the squabbles between the wives and the children, you know, and, and the, um, you know, his other wives, you know, um, and, and they, they, there's jealousy, there's squabbling, there's deceit, you know, they, they weren't perfect, you know. He, got, he gave Jacob, you know, she gave Jacob that goat skin to put on so that her husband would give him the blessing, you know, instead of Esau, you know, deceit, you know, for the children. She, she had a favorite there. Um, so, you know, it's not perfect, and, it's not, and there's no perfect in the Bible either. You know, God, God makes sure we know that, you know, that we don't put ourselves up there on a pedestal. God knows us, but he also knows that each woman that he made has got a woman's heart. Um, and we as women have to take this um, role, this responsibility seriously. Um, we have a unique and crucial role in the lives of the children that have been get put in our care. And as we change and they change and we develop and they develop, we should never stop giving them the love, the care, the nurture and the encouragement that they will always need. You never know what child you are, have that relationship. You never know what child you are raising. It could be another Moses, it could be another Moses. And just to finish, um, we need as, as mothers to model ourselves with integrity, to do what we say, to live out what we say, biblically, to live out what we say, to be a model from which our child can learn from us by our godly lives. You know, don't, don't dilute that go out there in this world, this chaotic world, and live a life that shines in the darkness that our children can see, and they, we can be their example. And I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna read them, but there are a number of verses in the Bible that we can always take to our hearts to help us. Ephesians 6 and 4 is telling us to be involved in our children's lives. In Psalm 78, 5 and 6, is telling to teach our children the way. In Proverbs 13 and 24, it's telling us to discipline our children. You know, spare the rod, spoil the child, yeah? Um, Titus 2 and verse 4, to nurture our children. You know, we have this handbook, mothers, women, we have this handbook that we can use to help to bring up our children in a world where they need to be strong, they need to have principles and morals. And it's all there. But I just wanted to share that with you this Sunday, this Mothering Sunday. You know, each mother, each woman has a mother's heart. God has created us for a purpose, and we can't do the job without his help, you know, so don't try and do it on your own. So, um, yes, I hope um, somebody is taking something from that today. Um, and so I'll close with that. Um, before I, I, I finish, um, John did ask me if today we could pray for Israel and Gaza, if that's okay. Um, you know, the war is still going on there. Is, in fact, I believe it's escalating, you know, in many ways. And so he's asked me if I could pray for Gaza and Israel. And, you know, when we pray, you know, we should be praying for Israel and Gaza. We should still be praying for Ukraine and Russia. And sometimes it, it seems a bit overwhelming about what can we pray for. Sometimes we, we, we don't really know what's going on. We don't know how to pray. We don't know what to pray for. And so I went online and in tearfund.org, and I just, I just say, have a look when you get home in tearfund.org. And they've got a, an article in there, and it says, how to pray for Gaza and Israel, believe it or not. So it will help you. So I'm going to use this as a bit of a template. And um, we will pray, and we will ask God to intervene. So if, if we could all just come before the Lord.
because we, we live in a broken world. We live in a broken world. We know that. We've only got to look at the television or read a newspaper. But we know that our God is in the midst of all that chaos. And I also know that God expects us as Christians, as his children, to pray for the, um, the world, pray for world affairs, pray for wars that are going on, pray for the people that are being affected. But the first paragraph here it tells us to pray for peace. And so, Lord, we pray today for Israel and Gaza. We pray for an immediate ceasefire and an end to the violence. We pray, God, for world leaders with influence in the region to make wise decisions that lead to lasting peace. We pray that God's peace would fill the hearts and minds of everyone who is suffering as a result of the conflict. And now we pray for safety. We pray for all civilians that God would protect them from harm, particularly the most vulnerable, including children, older people, and people with disabilities. We pray also for the humanitarian workers, for protection for those who are working to provide humanitarian assistance and medical supplies. We pray for the safe access to food, water, sanitary items, medical supplies, fuel, and electricity. And we pray also for those poor people who are forced to flee their homes. We pray that they would find safe places to stay and that at some point in the future they will be able to return home. Now we pray for strength. We pray for church leaders, for wisdom and strength to lead people through fear and uncertainty. We pray for bravery as they guide their communities and offer loving support. For Christian communities and faith leaders across the, the region, for unity, connection, and mutual understanding so that they can help bring people together and show kindness. And we pray for those humanitarian workers that God would strengthen their resolve and ability to provide relief and humanitarian assistance. And now we pray for hope. We pray for those who are terrified, mourning and suffering in Israel and Gaza. We ask God to save them from despair, for the trauma and violence they've experienced, not to outshadow their hope. And we pray, Lord, that people in Gaza and Israel and in those wider regions, that they wouldn't lose hope that peace is possible because we know, Lord, you tell us with God all things are possible. And finally, Lord, we pray for healing. We pray for people who have been traumatized or injured. We ask God to heal their physical and emotional wounds and bring them deep comfort. We pray for hospitals and medical workers who are struggling with limited resources and overwhelming needs. We ask you, Lord, to provide all the resources and equipment they need to treat the sick and injured. We cry out to you, God, on behalf of the people seriously affected by the conflict in Gaza and in Israel. Our hearts break at the devastation and suffering that we see, and we know it breaks yours too. We ask that you would stretch out your mighty hand to bring an end to this war. We cry out for people who have been injured or traumatized, who have lost loved ones or their homes. Please provide everything they need and be their comfort, their hope, their healer, and their safe refuge. We pray for your peace to reign. We look to you as our savior and the hope of the world. Amen, amen. Thank you, Owen, thank you. We're just going to finish off with some sun worship.